remember we had our first child and we, we planned our first vacation, you know, with, with children. And we were living in Louisville, Kentucky at the time. And um, let's see here. I remember we, we were planning on going to Florida. So we were living in Kentucky. The plan was to go to Florida. So uh, keep in mind, this was prior to, you know, these guys, these smartphones. So instead of plugging in the destination on the smartphone and Google leading us the way, we had to do it the old-fashioned way, like the Lewis and Clark way, where we, we physically had to sit down at a computer and uh, print out the directions. I, I said that as a joke, Lewis and Clark printing it out. Um, but I, I did. That's what we did. Do I? Wasn't a good joke. Thank you. All right. So, um, so I printed out the directions. I charted the course. And uh, each, I remember I planned this out. Every three hours, which is essentially every large city, uh, we were going to stop as a family at, the, at each major city. We were gonna, I was going to do a quick Bible study, and I was, we were going to pray over the city and go on our way to the next, uh, the next three hours, which was essentially, you know, Nashville, Chattanooga, Atlanta, uh, et cetera. Now, I don't know if you've ever traveled with small children before, especially long distances. Obviously, I never had. Otherwise, I would not have planned that great spiritual journey down to Florida. Uh, needless to say, out of respect for for young children, uh, they they don't understand the concept of planning uh, or or agendas. You know, having a plan or even travel time for that instance. And obviously, I had the correct path down to Florida. It's just the trip didn't go as planned, at least that I had planned. Instead of stopping every three hours and praying over the city, uh, I remember praying, Lord, just help us get there. You know, it's <laughs> at least before my next birthday. You know, just help us get there. Well, last Sunday, uh, we examined the first part of a Bible verse in 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 8. And we talked about the purpose of biblical unity. And if, if you were not here last Sunday, that we, we learned that the purpose of biblical unity is to point others to Jesus. So the purpose of biblical unity is to point others to Jesus. So we know where we want to go. That's our destination, right? I would hope that as a church, that's our destination. We, we want to point others to Jesus. But the next question becomes, how do we get there? How do we do that? So today, we're going to continue looking at that verse. 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 8. And we're going to answer the big question. This is a big question I want us to answer today. What is the path? to biblical unity. Last week we talked about the purpose of biblical unity, so today we'll talk about the path to biblical unity. So if you haven't found it already, turn or swipe with me to 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 8. Once you find that verse, would you stand with me as we read that verse? And I think I've got it up on the screen too. And uh, 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 8. The apostle Peter writes to all of us, to each of us, finally, all of you have unity of mind, sympathy, brotherly love, a tender heart, and a humble mind. This is the word of the Lord. You may be seated. All right, uh, let's go to the Lord in a word of prayer. Would you pray with me? Let's bow our heads. Father, I thank you for these who are here today. God, I thank you that you have called us here today. God, it's not by accident that we have gathered today, but God, it's by your purpose, by your plan that we are here. Uh, God, I pray that you will lead us and help us 
as we continue worshiping you. God, we've worshiped through song, we've worshiped through giving, and we've worshiped through fellowship. God, I pray now that you would help us in worshiping through listening to your word and help us to worship by responding to your word. God, help us to not just hear your word and then walk away like, like nothing ever happened or like we never heard anything. God, help us, God, as we hear your word, to respond. God, may what your word is teaching us today, may it change us radically. God, that's why you've created us. God, you've created us with a purpose. It's for your glory and so that we can enjoy you. So God, I pray, God, that you will help us to respond in a way that we can live our lives for your glory. And Father, I pray for those who aren't Christians. God, as they hear this, God, as as they see us uh, look to Jesus, even as Christians, God, I pray that you would help them also see that the hope of Christ for their life can be found by placing their faith and trust in his life, death, and resurrection. And it's in his name we pray. Amen. All right. So last Sunday, uh, we started this kind of a mini sermon series, if you will. And uh, I've, I've titled it Biblical Unity. And we're still going through Peter, uh, but I wanted to kind of slow down, kind of hit the brakes a little bit as we got to this verse. Uh, number one, because trying to cram everything about biblical unity in the one sermon you know, might, might take a little bit longer and I may leave out some pieces. So I wanted to make sure that I take my time talking about biblical unity. And I believe biblical unity is so important for the church and it's important for our culture. You see, our culture is searching for unity. People are searching for unity everywhere. Whether it's searching to be unified around a politician or, uh, or around an idea or an agenda or around a sports team. People even try to become unified around a cat video on YouTube. Right? People are searching for unity. But when we look at Peter, and if we go back a couple of chapters, you don't have to turn there, but Peter has already challenged us in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 13. Peter said, prepare your minds for action. So he's already challenged us all the way back in chapter 1. Okay, prepare your mind for action. So now, after we've gone through chapter 1 and chapter 2, now we're in chapter 3. Peter now challenges us. Now in verse 8, have unity of mind. So we prepared our mind. Now Peter encourages us, have unity of mind. But how can this be? If you remember back in chapter 1, the church was scattered, right? They were in scattered in various places. Things were not like they used to be for this church, and they are facing persecution. Now let's apply that to us today. How can this be? You know, how can a church this size, with as many members as we have on the roll, how can we have biblical unity? How can we as a church that averages what we do on Sunday mornings, how can we have biblical unity? What Peter's telling us here in 1 Peter 3, 8, and that's the big question before us today. What's the path? What's the path to biblical unity? Thankfully, Peter gives us the answer, and the answer is so simple. It's actually a Sunday school answer. The path to biblical unity is Jesus. Jesus. And again, I know that sounds simple. And I know we could just close up our Bible and go on, go to tequilas for lunch. But we already learned in chapter 2 that Jesus is not only our great sin bearer, but he is our great example. So, I want us to keep our great example in mind. So, as we look to Jesus as our great example, we keep in mind that we also look at 1 Peter 3, 8, 
what I want us to see is our path to biblical unity. And the first point that we see today is the path to biblical unity first is a Christ-like attitude. So the path to biblical unity first is a Christ-like attitude. Now, again, if you remember, chapter 2, verse 21, Peter gave us the example. He said, Jesus is our great example. So as Christ followers, our goal is to be like Jesus. So if you say you are a Christian, then you are a follower of Christ. You are to be like Jesus. So now in 1 Peter 3.8, Peter tells us how we can imitate Jesus in our unity. And Peter declares, finally, all of you have unity of mind. Now, this word mind, I want to talk about that just for a moment. The word mind can be defined as mindset. So have unity of mindset. Another way to put it, an attitude. So have a unified attitude. So in our unity, we begin by looking to Jesus. But now in verse 8, we see we begin by having the same Christ-like attitude. Now I'm going to go ahead and begin this first point with a question. And this question is not to attack anyone, but it's a question for self-evaluation. It's a question I've asked myself during this week, and I want to have you ask yourself this question as well. Does your attitude reflect Jesus? This is something I can't see. I can't see your attitude. So I want you to ask yourself, how does your attitude reflect Jesus? Now maybe as you're thinking about that, maybe you're asking yourself, well, what was the attitude of Jesus? What is Jesus' attitude? Well, we've already examined his attitude, his attitude, if you recall, back in chapter 2. Peter wrote in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 21, for to this you have been called. Again, he's speaking to all of us. This is what, to, this is what we've been called to because Jesus also suffered for you, leaving you an example so that you might follow in his steps. You see, the attitude that Jesus had that we learned about in chapter 2 is that Jesus had an attitude, he had a willingness to suffer. He had a willingness to suffer. In the Gospels, uh, the Gospels uh, in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, first four books in the New Testament, um, G Matthew describes a time when a man came up to Jesus. And he came up to Jesus with a question. And uh, it was actually a statement. Uh, he, he declared, Lord, I will follow you wherever you go. Uh, sounds kind of like a hymn, right? Wherever you lead, I'll go. So he said, Lord, I will follow you wherever you go. It's a great statement. It's something that we invite everyone to do. Follow Jesus wherever he leads. It's where we want you to follow. But do you know what Jesus responded? In Matthew chapter 8, verse 20, Jesus said this to the man. Foxes have dens, or they have holes in the ground. Birds of the air have nests. But Jesus said the Son of Man doesn't even have a place to lay his head. So he said that, and then someone else came up to Jesus. And he said this, Jesus, I will follow you. Again, that's great. That's what we were looking for. But the man said, first, I'll follow you, but first, let me go bury my father. You know, Jesus, you know what his response was? Jesus said, follow me and let the dead bury their dead. You see the point that Jesus is making in these two interactions. He was teaching this and showing us that we are to have an attitude of leaving 
everything behind to follow Jesus on the path of suffering. You see, the path of suffering for Jesus led Jesus to be betrayed by a disciple. The path of Jesus led Jesus to be arrested by the officials. The path of suffering led Jesus to be denied by another disciple. The path of suffering led Jesus to be slapped on the face. The path of Jesus led Jesus to be spit upon, to be beaten, to be condemned, to die the death of a criminal. The path of suffering led Jesus to be mocked, to be laughed at, to wear a crown of thorns. The path of suffering led Jesus to be nailed to a cross, to die a painful death. Jesus was willing to suffer. Why? Why? For you. For you. Again, Peter said, chapter 2, verse 21, For to this you have been called, because Christ also suffered for you. You see, Jesus suffered because we were like sheep that were going astray. We were lost, okay? We were off the path. We were lost. We were searching. We were trying to come up with our own way, but our own way was leading to destruction. So Jesus willingly suffered for us. So, if Jesus willingly suffered, if Jesus was willing to suffer for us, we who were lost, who were like sheep, who were going astray, then let's ask ourselves, if he's our great example, are you willing to suffer for those who are straying? Are you willing to suffer for those who are straying? First, do you recognize anyone in your life who's straying from God? Do you know anyone that's straying from God? And are you willing to suffer because they are straying for God? You see, church members, members of our church, we can become unified when we are willing to suffer to reach the lost. So, do you trust God enough to suffer in the steps of Jesus? You see, if, if we are unwilling to trust God in the suffering so that we're not even suffering for the sake of others, then perhaps we're on the wrong path to unity. And this leads us to the second point we see in the passage we see next that the path to biblical unity is not only a Christ-like attitude, but it's Christ-like character. Now let's continue on back to 1 Peter. In 1 Peter 3.8, Peter continues, Finally, all of you have unity of mind. Again, we define mind as having an attitude. So having a unified attitude, he continues, have sympathy. Brotherly love, a tender heart. Let's stop there. You see, sympathy, brotherly love, a tender heart, these are all actions toward other people. They are to be shown and demonstrated towards others. The word sympathy. The word sympathy literally has this literal meaning of having a feeling like with another, having a feeling like with another. Brotherly love means that you just don't see someone as a friend, but brotherly love means that you see someone as family. In a tender heart, that's simply compassion, compassion towards others. Now again, who's our great example? Jesus. So, we see each of these actions 
in Christ. We see these actions in Jesus. Jesus was sympathetic toward us by becoming sin for us. Jesus calls us brothers and sisters. Hebrews 2.11 says that Jesus is not ashamed to call us brothers. Jesus was compassionate toward us and that while we were sinners, Jesus died for us. So when we place our faith and our trust in the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus, he not only saves us from sin and death, but he saves us to become more and more like Jesus. So when you join a local church, for example, here at First Baptist Church, especially here, we commit to one another that we Grow in Christ's likeness together. So that means by the power of the Holy Spirit, our attitude and our character are to reflect Jesus. Now again, I'll ask this question. It's a question for us all just to consider. And it's to, for us to consider not only as Christians, but if you're a member, consider this question. Does the way you live your life reflect Christ? Does the way you live your life reflect Jesus? You see, we can't be a unified church if we live however we want to live. We must follow Jesus and we must follow him together. But how can we follow Jesus together? How should we reflect Jesus in our actions, as members of a church. Let's put it simply and biblically, a a spirit-filled life and even a spirit-filled church reflects the character of Jesus. So let's talk about spirit-filled life and even a spirit-filled church. Are you a loving Christian? Are you a loving church member? Are you a joyful Christian? Are you a peacemaking church member? Are you a patient Christian? Are you kind toward each other? Do you demonstrate goodness towards others within our church? Are you a faithful church member? Are you faithful to God? Are you faithful to your family? Are you faithful to one another? Are you a gentle Christian? What about self-controlled? Are you a self-controlled Christian? You know what these actions that I've just talked about, you know what they're sometimes called? The fruit of the Spirit. We find those in Galatians. But these actions are also evidence of a spirit-filled church, a unified church. Because following the path that Jesus leads to Christ-like character. So let's, let's examine our life. Let's examine our walk with the Lord. And what areas that I've just went through, love, joy, peace, patience, What areas in your life do you need to examine personally? What areas in your life do you need to confess to the Lord that you are not living by the Spirit in these areas of your lives? And these are significant questions that that I really want you to ask because this leads to the next and final point that we see in 1 Peter 3.8. And it's the final step The final way that we see to unity in the path to biblical unity is not only a Christ-like attitude or Christ-like character, but finally, it is Christ-like humility. Again, let's reread verse 8. Peter said, finally, all of you have unity of mind. Be sympathetic towards one another. Brotherly love, a tender heart, and finally, have a humble mind. Now, 
We know a lot about humility. You hear it in Sunday school a lot or even hear it through sermons. But let's talk about it within the culture. Here's Peter's writing this. He's pinning it. And he's writing this letter to the scattered churches. They live in ancient Rome. So they're scattered in different places in this Roman culture. At this time period, Romans, Roman culture, did not value humility. As a matter of fact, they tried to live opposite of humble. They thought that humility was a sign of weakness. They thought that humility was shameful. They thought if someone showed humility that they were unable to defend their honor. In essence, humility was, was showing that you are powerless. So as Peter wrote in chapter 3, verse 8, have humility or a humble mind, that raised some eyebrows as this letter is being read. But again, let's consider our great example. Let's consider Jesus. Yeah, I love Colossians chapter 1. Colossians is a New Testament book in the Bible. Colossians 1 verses 15 through 20 declares boldly that Jesus is all-powerful. He's all-powerful. And right before Jesus was crucified, the soldiers came to take Jesus away to be crucified. Jesus told his disciples, told the soldiers, do you not know that I have power and authority to call legions, which would be thousands of angels? John chapter 1, verse 1 declares that, that Jesus made all things and that Jesus was before all things. So the Bible from beginning to end declares that Jesus is all-powerful. But when Jesus came to this earth, he was wrapped in swaddling clothes. When he came to this earth, they laid him down in an animal feeding trough. He lived on this earth without a mansion. He didn't have a roof over his head, and we just learned earlier, he didn't have an, even have a place to lay his head down. He took upon himself the form of a servant. And he took upon himself the form of a servant, and he humbled himself to demonstrate, to display obedience to the Father's plan for our salvation. So as we look to our great example, we learn from Jesus' humility. Unified Christians are humble Christians. Unified Christians declare they are powerless without the power of the Holy Spirit. A unified church is a humble church. Unity begins with Humility. There's a famous author, pastor from the 1800s. His name is Andrew Murray. He once said this. Humility, the place of entire dependence upon God, is the first duty of the creature. So it's the first duty of humans. And it's the root of every virtue. He said, and so pride... Or the loss of this humility is the root of every sin and evil. You see, humility begins with confession. First, humility begins with confessing our sin. I love 1 John. And in 1 John 1, 9, John writes... If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Is pride, again, the root of sin, as Andrew Murray talked about, is pride keeping you from confessing your sins before God? 
God sees your pride. God sees it. God sees your fear. God sees your doubt. God sees your worry. God sees that powerlessness. So today ask yourself, what sin is causing disunity between you and God? What sin is causing disunity between you and brothers and sisters? Examine your heart because God sees it all. Yet Jesus is still not ashamed to call you brother or to call you sister. So today, my brothers and sisters, the call, the invitation is to confess, is to confess your sins before God. But humility also confesses our powerlessness. Humility confesses not only our sin, but it confesses we are powerless. Again, Andrew Murray, in his book, he said this, God has a plan for his church upon the earth. But alas, we too often make our plan and we think that we know what ought to be done. And then we ask God to bless our feeble efforts instead of absolutely refusing to go unless God go before us. So today, are you willing to confess to God in prayer that you are powerless without him? Are you willing to confess as church members that we as a church, we are powerless without God? But humility not only confesses sin and our powerlessness, but humility acknowledges our dependence upon God and upon his power. So today, do you need to confess this powerlessness without God? Is that something you need to confess? Because I want you to know, this might, might be a little freeing for some of you, but God is not looking for you to have it all together. God's not looking for you to have all the answers God's not seeking your strength to hold your family together. He's not seeking your strength to hold your friendships together. He's not looking for your strength to hold this church together. But his invitation for all of us is to come to Jesus. All who are weary and are heavy laden. Jesus said he will give you rest Jesus said, take his yoke upon you. Learn from Jesus. Jesus is gentle. He is lowly in heart. And you will find rest for your souls. Humility acknowledges and it confesses our dependence upon God. We desperately need this. We desperately need to cry out to God and to seek his power in our life and in the life of our church. Like we looked at this biblical path to, to, uh, to unity. And this, this path to unity goes against all cultural strategies and methods for cultural unity. But biblical unity points others to Jesus Biblical unity points others to Jesus. So if we really want to see revival, it begins with our Christ-like attitude, our Christ-like character, and our Christ-like humility. So again, it's an invitation to prayerfully examine your heart. What sin is causing disunity between you and God? What sin is causing disunity between you and our church? Maybe today you need to confess 
to God a sinful lifestyle or even a sinful character that does not reflect Jesus? Do you need to confess a selfish attitude before God? The invitation today is to come to Jesus and to pray, confess your sin to God. God knows it. He knows the pride in your heart. So the invitation he's calling out is to come. Maybe today you're a church member. And maybe today for some, maybe you need to confess to God your lack of a desire for unity. Maybe you just, maybe you have an unwilling attitude. Perhaps you've been unfaithful as a church member. Or maybe you've lacked humility. Today I invite you to confess your sin. Come to God. Confess your powerlessness to Him. Confess your dependence upon God. We need God. And today if you're a sinner, my invitation to you, come to Jesus. My prayer is is that when we have our invitation time in the service is that as you see our church pray and confess to God, my prayer is for you is that you will come to God. Is that you will place your faith, your trust in the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus for your sin. So in just a moment, we're going to sing a song of invitation. I'm going to stand up here at the altar. I want to pray with you. I'm going to stand here. I would love to pray with you. Come up, let me shake your hand, and let me talk with you about how to become a Christian. We're going to have people praying that you will do that. So that's the invitation for you. Would you bow with me as we pray?